Welcome to our Sunday School lesson this week, Shady Grove Family and Friends. It's good to have you. I trust you've had a, a good week, and I uh, trust that you hear something in the lesson today that can, uh, that can help you in your life and walk with God. And Basically, we're talking about today a closer walk with God and through our prayer life. And uh, So we're in session three. If you have your Sunday School book, we're on page 118. Intimacy with Jesus is the title of the lesson. And the point of the lesson uh, is prayer draws us closer to Jesus as our hearts uh, align with his. And we're looking at John 17, verses 1 through 5, and verses 21 through 26. Uh, let's bow for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this opportunity, Lord, to study your word, the health and strength we have, Lord, to just get up this morning, and we just thank you for all of that. We just uh, pray, Lord, that uh, through this lesson that we will uh, learn something or understand something, Lord, that will ultimately, Lord, uh, make us want to walk closer with you and have that relationship. Of course, in Christ's name we pray. Amen. So the first part of the lesson is the author talks about social media and how the social media might distract us from important things like, you know, spending time with our family and friends and, of course, God. Now, I'm like almost every other American. I have a phone. I do look at it quite a bit during the day. Um, I do get quite a few messages. I send messages make a few calls, get a few calls, and I do some reading on there. Uh, I think when I think of uh, this, you know, uh, social media though, you know, the, the Facebooks, the Instagrams, the, that type of thing, Twitter, I personally have a kind of a negative connotation. Uh, seems like I've seen it used more in a negative way or it comes out to be a negative way whether they mean to or not. People just spontaneously spouting off their emotions over things and you know our words even though they're not spoken words personally you know whatever you write or say that the public can read uh, and then some of the information people give me I don't really want to know that about you in your life or your personal life or whatever but it can be used for good. And the author of the lesson does talk a little bit at the end of the lesson, some uh, positive ways that social media uh, is, is being used. But it, it, uh, I wanna refer to the middle of the page. The author talks about on average, some 3.2 billion users spend two hours and 22 minutes per day on social media every day. And, you know, uh, in my restaurant, I noticed this. When Pam and I go out to eat, I noticed this. Uh, waiting in, of course, you can't, can't have so many people in waiting rooms in different places now, but I, I mean, everybody's always on their phone, always on their phone. And uh, it used to be, I used to make fun of the teenagers, but it's not just teenagers now. But, uh, Enough on social media. Let's turn the page uh, on 120. We're going to look at John 17, 1 through 5. And it says, These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Now this is not really the lesson, but a point I want to make for verse 3. You know, Christ... Uh, who's praying here, a uh, very heartfelt prayer. This is a, a time of uh, anxiety for him as he's contemplating the cross and he's praying to God. And 
he mentions, of course, the Father God and himself, Jesus Christ. And so many in our world today, I find when I, you know, watch uh, maybe uh, movie personalities, uh, TV personalities, you know, they'll they'll maybe recognize a God or they'll refer to God, but many times you don't hear Jesus Christ referenced, and you can, you know, with the God we serve, you don't have one without the other, and so. I just want to make that point. Uh, so Jesus is always our best example for anything in the Bible, any situation. And this is not his model prayer, but he is showing us how to pray to the Father. And you see it very heartfelt. It's a very deep prayer. Uh, it, it's not just a, a casual say the words type of thing. When we know God, we want to spend time with Him. And sometimes time is an issue. Uh, you know, our lives, no, nobody's life is maybe exactly like anybody else's. You have responsibilities. You have you know, some jobs, uh, you work maybe as little as four hours, some maybe eight, some 10, some maybe a 12 hour shift. Uh, you know, maybe finding that time to spend with God is maybe not a big chunk of time. Maybe, you know, uh, we make it more like a, a drive through And if that's all we do, then that's probably the wrong thing. But, you know, just spending time, if you can go through a lot of drive throughs you're spending time with God. But the main thing is that we're spending time and it's our attitude, I think, that's important. So, as the author mentions, we got to get away from just making our prayers a long list of requests and just asking God, asking God, asking God. Uh, so we know Christ used parables to, you know, the real life situations to make it point. I want to do a probably a bad job and try to. So if. Let's say when you become a you know adult and maybe you kind of get out on your own, and uh, your parents still live close enough by to see them, you know if you visited your parents just occasionally, uh, and uh, when you did visit them, uh, you know you immediately said, "Hey, I need a hundred dollars." Or, you know, my point is every time you went to see them, it was about to get something or you needed something. You know, after a while, they're not stupid. They're going to realize, you know, they only come see me when they want something, when they need something. And, you know, sometimes we may be treated God that way. And, you know, I've kind of heard it somewhat used as a spare tire. We use God as a spare tire when we're only in trouble. Uh, I've also heard it, you know, sometimes we treat him like a, a, a genie where, you know, we get three wishes and, you know, God grant his wishes, so to speak. But really what God wants is, you know, he wants us to have a conversation with him. And the first thing we need to do is just recognize him, who he is, I think we need to be reverent. We don't have to have a bunch of these and thous, but we need to be reverent. It, you know, if I went to my mother and said, uh, hey, old lady, give me $100. Wow, <laughs> that ain't going to work, come off very good, is it? And I think uh, God was, would not deal very well with us being uh, irreverent. But we can uh, feel like we're just having a conversation with him and, uh, and, and letting... Uh, you know, we do have petitions. I, I don't want to uh, everybody to think that uh, we can't bring our petitions to God. He wants us to. But if that's the only thing we're doing, then, then we're not having a relationship that, that he desires and he wants. So, uh, so when we look at this, uh, look down towards the, the next last paragraph, uh, when we take the time, and make the effort to become closer to God and know Him better, 
then a lot of times we're going to feel his his unseen calming touch he calls it and he, and we're going to not be as anxious and and relax and one of the things that i come across i don't know a couple weeks ago uh, in one of the devotions i was looking at come from isaiah 26 3 uh, and he basically the author uh, of that devotion basically just narrowed it down to this. It said, and talking about God, focus plus trust equals peace. If we focus on God and trust Him, then peace will, will come from that. And that's basically uh, what the author's talking about here. Many of Jesus' prayers uh, in, in the Gospel of John talked about God's glory to be shown. And, uh, you know, my brother John often refers to uh, uh, Experiencing God book and how the first thing he talks about is about God and not about us. And that is that's true, but so easily we make God, we make everything about church about us first and our comfort and our needs. And, you know, if we have the right focus uh, it's like uh, one of my earliest, I've referred to this before, but one of my earliest uh, or one of my fondest recollections of Bible school uh, or a uh, yeah, Bible school lesson was, uh, I'm sorry, the teacher's not going to get credit here because I don't remember who it was, but drawing a, a wheel uh, with spokes out and, and in the center was Jesus. And then out the spokes would be work or school or finances or whatever. And the idea is if Jesus is the center, if he's our focus, then everything revolves around it just like it's supposed to and it'd be a lot smoother. Well, when we look at uh, some of the ways that Jesus referred to his, his glory being shown, it was when Lazarus was at the tomb and he told Mary, that she was about to see the glory of God if she would believe. Uh, in his triumphant re-entry, uh, and Jesus confessed that his soul was troubled, but he said, you know, he said, Father, glorify thy name. Through it all, you know, he was troubled by this. He knew what he was about to go through, but ultimately he said, God, it's, a, you know, it's about you. May your name be glorified. And a lot of our prayers should be about, you know, God getting the glory uh, through it all. Uh, he talks about uh, Jesus prayed that those who have been given eternal life would see that glory. Now, we know one day we're going to see uh, in all his glory face to face. But we can have a part of that here on earth now, you know, if, if we'll do it. Uh, a couple of my favorite verses slash phrases is, you know, if we, if we see Jesus, he said this, if, we, if you see him high and lifted up, I don't know how you can't uh, see him on the cross and not get a, a warm feeling from, from what he was doing. And uh, another phrase that, uh, uh, again, I'm not sure who, in this phrase, but I liked it. He was talking about a, a revival. He said, we need to fall in love with Jesus all over again. And uh, I, I think that's aptly put. You know, think about marriages. Sometimes marriages kind of get a little stale. I mean, not mine. Not mine. You know, but some marriages I hear get a little stale. And you know, you get that spark or whatever you kind of fall in love all over again and get it re-energized and that's that's what we need to do uh with a prayer life and in the way we see uh see uh, christ uh so in the model prayer jesus gave gave us to pray i'm sorry with the request our father which is art which art in heaven hallowed be thy name again Recognizing God's glory, recognizing who He is, being reverent. All right, and uh, as author says, we need to break free from approaching God 
with just request. We need to learn to pray because we need him uh, is what we need to do. Uh, and again, it's, it's you know, just, a, just good morning, Lord. Uh, sometimes I, I get up real early and, and you know, I be honest with you, on my way to work so early in the morning, uh, my first uh, thought is, uh, don't hit a deer. They're everywhere, and I'm still about half asleep. And I'm like, just don't hit a deer, you know, whatever. So sometimes, you know, my first uh, conversation with the Lord is just, good morning, <laughs> help me, give me work. But uh, we need to just uh, want to have a conversation with God. Let's look at uh, John 17, 21 through 23, that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, and that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and thou in me, and that they may be made perfect in one, that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them, as thou hast loved me. So Christ is always, he's, he's referring here basically to the Trinity and, you know, the closeness of, of being one. I can't explain it. I can't explain it, uh, the Trinity, but, but I believe it. And I like, um, I've heard uh, one pastor say, you know, if we understood everything about God, he wouldn't be much of a God. And uh, so you just you just take things uh, by faith, and this is one thing. But Jesus prayed about the unity that they have, and He prays that we will have the unity. And we've had some lessons, really, not that long ago on unity in the church. Uh, you know, when I look at this country, uh, I personally, in my lifetime, I don't know that I can think of this country being any more divided than what it is. Now, I was alive when uh, civil rights stuff was going on in the 60s, but I was so young, I don't remember it. it you know, I don't have a real impression of it. Uh, but what I've seen in the last year or two is, you know, I can't imagine we're more divided. Uh, is is uh, unity possible? I, I, anything's possible, but we sure are divided. It was interesting that the author starts talking about uh, baseball, and you, this applies to any sport, but baseball and how baseball went to uh, uh, instant replay to, to try to solve conflicts and, and uh, you know, get calls right and, and uh, even refer to something that's actually at high point. It doesn't mention high point, but the Rockers are... Uh, like a minor league team in High Point. And it refers to that league using a robot umpire. And they still had an argument. Uh, with the uh, manager still arguing. And in the middle of the page, the author just, uh, he says it as good as I could. He says, as long as opposing teams with differing agendas take the field, unity would be difficult to achieve. People tend to see what they want to see. This happens at sporting events. It happens in everyday life. And if we're not Christ-focused, it can happen in the church. I coached for over 30 years, probably close to 35 years. Uh, every day I had parents, fans in the stands, and I knew that this was their attitude. Uh, if it was a close play at first, bang, bang, play, if it went against them, it had to be a wrong call. It couldn't be just a close play, but he got it right. If it was a close play and it went against us, it was wrong. And that's the way some people see things. They, uh, they always, you know, their agenda, they always see it their way. They don't see it other ways. Uh, and if that's the way it's going on in the church, that's, that's rough. Um, remember, we're to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and love our neighbor second. That's the order. Who was it, Gail Sayers, that had the uh, the book "I Am Third, and that's that's where he was. He considered himself on the list. That's where we need to be. But sometimes in church, you know, 
and we put us first. Or maybe we're second and we put the other person third uh, in the church. But uh, we got to strive for unity. And then some good points here. Jesus prayed for unity, not conformity. Uh, bottom line is, if we're focused on God, you know, what we're arguing about, or no, it's not, what we're concerned about may not be that big a deal. You've always heard the thing about, you know, the cold carpet being a source of an argument or whatever. It's not that big a deal. It's not that big a deal. Uh, it shouldn't, you know, there are some things that maybe we can't compromise on uh, what we believe strongly in, but we need to try to be unified. He says, the author says, our personalities are not, are not to be absorbed and lost by our unity. In other words, we're all, you know, whether you like chocolate or vanilla, that's, that's not the issue. Our personalities are not to be absorbed and lost, but our self-interest will be. So, uh, Philippians 2.2, 2, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Uh, so the author talks a little bit about, I'm on page 124 in the middle of the page, he talks a little bit about, you know, so far we've been kind of talking about, uh, you know, our individual prayer closet, so to speak. But he talks a little bit about corporate worship and how, you know, still that's important. Uh, I, I can imagine uh, you know, when we get together and pray specifically, uh, you know, over someone that maybe is getting ready to have surgery. Uh, I just believe that that is, that's a powerful prayer when we're all coming together. And of course, one thing I, you know, with unity, it's so important to be unified because when we're unified, God's glory is shown to the world. Uh, when we're divided, it is such a bad witness. Such a bad witness. I mean, why should I go to church? They don't get along any better than we do. Or they act like, you know, the people do at work or whatever. Uh, but, uh, we, you know, when we're unified, when we're praying together, that is a very strong, strong prayer, very strong source. Uh, let's look at John on page 125, John 24 through 26, the last three verses. It says, Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, and that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me. For thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. And I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. So, if as we grow in our relationship with God, we'll have an inter intimate relationship with him. Our hearts will be one with his, will love like he loves, will care for the people as he cares for them, and will pray for people, will uh, will want to help people, will want people to know him as uh, their savior. Uh, down at the bottom of the page says, well, Christians fail to agree on many things. We all can agree that people need the Lord. To carry out our role in the ministry of reconciliation, we must be unified in our purpose. We must be unified in sharing the gospel and with the people in our neighborhoods and all around the world who are dying to hear about Jesus Christ. You know, it, it's... It really is. It's so simple. Uh, you know, loving God with all our heart, soul, mind, and then loving people. If we do those two things, you know, it's, it's like the preacher said, the rest of the Bible really, the re other commandments don't have to be uh, preached on because we're automatically not doing those things. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's just about putting God first. 
about wanting to spend time with him. And then what evolves out of that is we want to love and help others. On page 126, uh, the author does tell us uh, some things about social media. Yeah, it does distract us, but you can see some positive things on there. Uh, I do not post stuff on Facebook. I don't react. I do read Pam's Facebook a little bit to kind of see what's happened or going on or whatever. And I see a lot of Christian posts. I do see a lot of Christian posts. Problem is, I sometimes see some Christian things and then the, the next thing they put on there, I'm like, wow, that's, I can't believe you did that. But anyway, but uh, there are a lot of good positive uh, you know, prayer requests put on there and stuff like that. Well, the author has some statistics here. 28% of believers share their faith via social media. 28%. You know, I, I would be interested to know uh, specific examples of people, uh, maybe hear a testimony of someone that actually, you know, accepted Christ uh, or was highly influenced to accept Christ. Uh, through a social media post. I'd be very interested to know that. And then 58% of non-believers have had someone share their faith with them uh, through Facebook. So it, it it's, can be used in obviously in a very positive way uh, if it would be. And, uh, you know, God has allowed that technology to, to take place and happen. And uh, it, it's only sinful when we use it for sinful reasons uh, but uh, you know it's one way that we can certainly uh, get the gospel out there and, and maybe help people well uh, let's bow for, for a closing word of prayer Heavenly Father we just uh, basically Lord are, are talking about just having a closer walk with you Lord through our prayer life for recognizing who you are, for having talks and conversations with you, Lord, because we are close to you, Lord, because we love you. And we know you, you love us first. And Lord, just uh, help us, Lord, to have that closer walk. And we know, Lord, that through that closer walk, Lord, we're going to be better servants for you. Uh, in the church doors, outside the church doors, Lord. And just we just pray, Lord, that we'll seek that uh, closer walk. And just bless us this day, for it's in Christ's name.